Good morning. My name is Rebecca Sharp, and I'm an archive specialist, and I provide reference guidance at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> if you just tuned in, I have a few quick notes before we start the next presentation. You can submit your questions for a speaker via <clears throat> Twitter using hashtag GenFair2014 or through YouTube chat. The speaker may not be able to answer all of your questions during the allotted 10-minute Q&A session. For captioning, go to the Virtual Genealogy Fair website and click on the link for today. The lectures will be recorded and they will be available on the Fair website by the end of November. Lecture number 13 is entitled, Discovering Your Family's Past in Military and Early Veterans Administration, Personnel Data Records and Selective Service Records. We have three speakers with us this morning, David Harden, Daria Lubensky, and Stephen A. Smith. Military personnel data records contain a wealth of information about America's veterans. Record series that we will discuss include burial case files, chaplain's files, Army courts martial case files, and veterans administrative World War I claim files. Selective service records hold valuable genealogical data, such as dates of birth, address of residency, family members' names, and a place of birth. We will discuss the World War II and post-World War II selective service records in our custody. Stephen A. Smith is a supervisory archivist, Daria Lubensky is an archivist, and David is a student intern. They all work at the National Archives in St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm turning the microphone over to our speakers. Thank you so much and good morning. On behalf of Daria and Steve, I just want to welcome everyone here for our presentation. Um, Starting with our slides, my part of the presentation is Selective Service Records, the National Archives, uh, St. Louis. So starting on slide three, what is Selective Service? Uh, selective Service is the vehicle to raise a military through conscription as opposed to voluntary enlistment. And the system was in place to determine who was available, who would be deferred, and finally, who would be rejected for military service. Slide number four. So the collection, what do we have? Today we're talking about the World War II era and the post-World War II era. The World War II era collection contains registration cards, classification ledgers, and alien registration files. And the post-World War II era contains registration cards and classification ledgers. Moving on to slide five, an important note, not all men who registered served in the military and not all men who served in the military registered. This is very important. Um, so during World War II, uh, who registered? This was open for men, United States citizens, and non-citizen residents in the United States. Those also living in the United States, Washington, D.C., are territories and citizens living abroad. And the date of births covered are from April 28, 1877 through March 31, 1929. And this was during seven registration periods that they registered for the World War II period. During six of these, men were available for, for conscription into the military. But in the fourth registration, however, men were not liable for military service. The next slide, slide six. This fourth registration was also known as the old man's draft. And I wanted to bring this up because this, um, this era of the draft, this registration is very important because these men weren't liable. This is very unique. This was to gauge the occupation, occupational strength of the United States. And they filled out an occupational questionnaire that could have been used to determine what services these men could have provided during the war. 
Um, officially, this was never used by the military or the government, but I'm sure this was a major psychological victory. As you can see, over 14 million men registered and almost a million alone in New York City. This is the old man's draft, so these men who did register, who were alive on April 27th, 1942, their dates of birth are between April 28th, 1877, and February the 16th of 1897. Our next slide. So, starting with our registration cards, what can you find? And I'm going to go to the next slide to sort of walk you through on an actual registration card. So slide eight, please. So this is a registration card for World War II. This is Henry Greenberg's. Some of you may know him as Hank Greenberg. On the bottom you can see it uh, lists him as a celebrated baseball player. He played for the Detroit Tigers. The information that you can find from the registration cards were the name, order number, serial number, address at the time of registration, their mailing address, telefo telephone number, date of birth, place of birth, the employer's name and place of business, and moving to the back on slide nine, you can see descriptive information. So their height, their weight, how they were classified for complexion and race, and then other physical characteristics that would aid in identification. And then finally, the bottom will show the local board that they registered in. Moving on to the next slide, slide 10. The World War II classification. So this is where you find out if the registrant was available for military service, whether they were deferred or were rejected from military service. Um, from here, and I'll move on to slide 11 to walk you through an actual classification ledger. This is a ledger. From here you can find their name, order number, serial, their age, how they were classified for race, administrative information such as the date that they registered, the date the questionnaire was sent, etc. Moving on to slide 12. This is the second part of the ledger. And on here it will show the classification the date that they were to report for order, and their final disposition and date, whether they are accepted, denied, or delinquent, and any other additional remarks. In the remarks section, this varies from board to board um, what information was put in. And this had to do with whoever was working that local board. It was up to them um, and up to their attentiveness of what they wanted to put in. Um, so it could be nothing all the way to possible service numbers. Moving on to the next slide. Alien registration files. So during World War II, just like the post-World War II era, all non-citizen residents had to register as well. And they had to additionally fill out um, additional paperwork. And this included um, the DSS Form 304. I just want to point out on the top I have uniformity with a question mark. These files vary from state to state. Uh, files could be single reports like the DSS Form 304 or could contain other possible information. Uh, so it just varies from state to state on what was kept and what we have available. I'm going to move to the next slide, slide 14, to show you what the DSS Form 304 looks like. On here, you find personal information that is very important to the genealogy community. You can find uh, dates of birth, where they were born, um, what they were working, where they were working, where they lived in the United States. Moving on to the next slide, slide 15, shows a lot of the background information of family, where they, um, where they were originally where they came from, what country they came from, and if they had any relatives that were still living in that country. Other possible finds in the alien registration files, you could find registration cards, registrations of Japanese descent, correspondence, discharge paperwork, physicals, reports for induction, and possibly much more. This again varies from state to state. Moving on to the next slide, slide 16. 
the post-World War II. So just like the World War II uh, registration, this was open for men only. Uh, United States citizens and non-citizen residents also had to apply. Those living in the United States, Washington, D.C., its territories, and citizens living abroad. And this was, the dates of birth were from January 1st, 1922 to March 28th, 1957. And this was done as a rolling registration. During World War II, for the first six registrations, there were very specific dates that men would register, either one specific day or possibly three days. Um, at the end of the sixth registration, they finally realized that a rolling registration would work best, and that's what they also did during the post-World War II um, era. Moving on to our next slide, slide 17. Could someone have registered twice? As some of you may have noticed, the dates overlap from the World War II era to the post-World War II era. Um, so there is a possibility that someone registered for the World War II era and the post-World War II era. So these are dates of birth from January 1st, 1922 to the end of March, 1929. Uh, the cards that I have up are for Yogi Berra, the baseball player. I have his World War II card on the left and his post-World War II registration on the right. The great thing about the post-World War II registration, it has a place for prior service. And because Yogi did serve in the Navy during World War II, it shows his information on the back of the post-World War II card. So you see that he served in the Navy. It has his uh, service number and also his dates of service. Moving on to the next slide, slide 18. So the post-World War II registration, what can we find? I'm going to walk you through a card just like I did for the World War II registration. So on the next slide, please. Since Halloween is coming up, I thought it would be nice to show Stephen King's card for everyone out there for a quick scare. Uh, on here, just like the World War II registration, you can find their name, selective service number. As you can tell, this number did change from how the structure was during the World War II registration. Uh, during World War II, you were given an order number and a serial number. For the post-World War II era, they figured out a much better system. So your selective service card can tell me exactly where this person registered. So the first number, 17, is the state of Maine. So I know that Stephen King registered in Maine. The next number is their local board. He registered in local board one. And for most states, this is alphabetical. So he registered in Androscrogan County, which is the first alpha um, county for that state. So he's local board number one. The next number, 47, he was born in 1947. And then finally, he was the 607th person to register that year for, um, for that local board for 1947. On here, you can find his name, the number as well, address at the time of registration, mailing address, telephone number, date and place of birth, descriptive information such as height, weight, eye color, and hair color, and any physical characteristics that would aid in identification uh, if they had to go looking for Mr. King. So as you can tell, he had a scar on his left arm. On the back of the card, next slide please, we have uh, occupational history, so he was a student, and it shows his high school that he was attending, his place of employment, which would have been where his high school was at, but if the person was working, they would include that information there. And then finally, any prior active, active duty or membership in a reserve component. Next slide, please. Next, the post-World War II classification. Just like the World War II uh, classification, this is where they would decide if a person was available, whether they would be deferred, or whether they would be rejected from military service. Uh, and I'll walk you through a post-World War II classification on the next slide to show you what you can find. On there you have the name of the person, selective service number, date of birth, date of classification questionnaire, mailing and return, classifications and dates, and then physical dates, the date they entered the military if they did, 
how they entered, whether they were enlisted, inducted, or possibly even ordered, the branch of service, date of separation, and then finally remarks. And just like the World War II era, just want to point out the, the remarks section was open to um, whatever the person that was filling in these reports, uh, what they wanted to put in. So you may find nothing, you may find um, their possible service number, or even more information there. Next slide, please. So how do I request what, how do I request and what do I need? Um, I included a link to our website. From there, you can find our request form. What's really important is having the full name of the registrant, the date of birth of the registrant, and the address that they resided when they registered for selective service. So not the address that they resided when they went into the service, but the address that they used when they registered for selective service. That ties them to a local board, and that helps me find the information. It helps me find the registration and the classification. Uh, if you do have the selective service number, that's great. Please include that. That'll help me find it that much more. And then finally, at the end, I have copy fees for the registration card would be $7, and then both for the classification and registration, that's $27. Finally, the next slide. I put a uh, our request form there that you can find online, and I do hope that many of you out there send those in. I'm looking forward to answering a lot of those requests. If you received the handout, and I hope that you print that out, I included uh, a few websites for reference for you. I included our website. Uh, the next one is Registration and Selective Service during World War II. Uh, this was a publication that Selective Service put out, and it has a lot of background information. This is through the Hottie Trust, which has a lot of uh, digital uh, books and publications that are open to the public that don't fall under copyright. Uh, the next website is for Selective Service Classifications. Uh, because I couldn't go into full detail of the classifications today, if you do receive or do ask for request a classification, from here you can find out what the specific classifications mean. So 1A if they were available, all the way to 4F if they were rejected for military service. And then finally, I included the Selective Service website. They do have a lot of good information there. Uh, and on there, I included some information about some digitization projects that we're working on with Ancestry. Over the next five years, we will have digitized all five or all um, all World War II registrations, and this will be done over the next five years and available uh, on Ancestry. And this is available for free at all NARA facilities that have public research rooms. And next, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen Smith. Thank you so much. Hello, thank you, David. As he said, I'm Stephen Smith. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, Army Court Martial Case Files and Army Chaplain Monthly Reports. So, first slide. And there we are, slide 26. First, we'll talk about Army Courts Martial Case Files. As you can see, these are in the online public access database. Um, they cover the periods of 1917 to 1938, and then the newly accessioned group of records that we have here in St. Louis cover 1939 to 1976. These, as of yet, are not in the OPA database, but should be soon. The cases um, comprise of general courts martial and special court martials that resulted in a bad conduct discharge. They're arranged numerically by court-martial case number and may contain charges and specifications, pleas, proceedings, findings, sentences, and often exhibit material. Next slide. So here I have an example of an order from a, um, a famous case. This is uh, Jack R. Robinson, second lieutenant, and you may know him as Jackie Robinson, the famous baseball player. So this case in July of 1944 in Camp Hood, Texas, Mr. Robinson born, uh, boarded a, uh, a, a bus and sat in the middle of the bus with a, another woman and was asked by the driver to move to the back of the bus, which he refused. 
because at that time segregation no longer existed on military buses. Um, this turned into a little bit of a shouting match when they got to the next station and eventually uh, Jackie Robinson was taken into custody by the MPs. So this case has uh, sh can, can show the example on, on this, uh, this slide of the charges that were, that were stated against Mr. Robinson, his pleas, and then the, eventually the findings of not guilty. Next slide. Here's an example of statements that are often found in the court martial case files. This is a case 1945 of Lieutenant William Sincock and Lieutenant Theodore Belides. And in this case, they were a um, uh, they were navigating and flying a, a group of planes, and they thought that they were actually bombing the city of Freiburg, Germany, when in fact they were bombing Zurich, Switzerland. So as you can imagine, this was not a good situation. And they blamed it on dense clouds and thick haze, which restricted downward visibility to about five or six miles, as you can see in the, the second paragraph there. And then the last sentence, after bombs away, we proceeded on course and returned to base to learn of our unfortunate mistake. In the bombing, they dropped 24 tons of bombs and killed five people, destroying many uh, homes and, and buildings. This case is, is significant because this is the first time that American soldiers were ever criminally prosecuted for an act of friendly fire. And both men were actually found not guilty in the proceedings. Next slide. Now here you can see from the testimony in the case file for the same, the same court martial that the prosecution lists the exhibit items that they have uh, turned over and one of those you can see on the right hand side there is actual photos from the bombs being released and this, this came from one of the planes in the squad. And it, it's a little tough to see but on the right hand side there you can uh, see the bombs actually falling over the city. If you can go to the next slide please. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about monthly reports and personnel records. These are what we call chaplain files. They are also in the online public access database. They're arranged alphabetically. And these are reports of chaplain activities, religious services, visits, um, funerals, etc. will all be uh, accounted for in these monthly reports that the chaplain filled out. Each report includes the name, service number, grade or rank, religious denomination, unit, and the station of the chaplain. And that's the unit that the station was, that the chaplain was actually assigned to. Next slide. So here's another interesting case from these files. This is from the SS Dorchester that um, sank um, in during uh, World War I, sorry, World War II, 1944. And there were four chaplains that actually gave up their, their life vests to other soldiers so that they could survive. And what you see in front of you here is an affidavit from one of the, the, uh, the soldiers on board that actually witnessed them handing off the, the life belt. And he said, the last time I saw them, they were still praying, talking, and preaching to the soldiers. This ended up being a... a a very big story from, from World War II. And these chaplains, uh, should note, two of them were, were Protestants. One was a Catholic and one was a um, uh, Jewish rabbi. So in 1960, the, uh, the military came up with the Chaplain's Medal of Heroism and all of these, these men received it posthumously. And also in 1948, they were um, uh, their images were put on a postage stamp with the words, These Immortal Chaplains, Interfaith in Action. Next slide. Now here is a, a, a page from a monthly report by Chaplain Henry Grecki, and he was one of the chaplains assigned to uh, services for the Nuremberg prisoners. 
and he was actually um, from the St. Louis area, so we find it pretty interesting. Um, his his job was to hold services for any of them that were willing to to listen, that wanted to give confessions, etc. And he states here that I was at Gehring's bedside when he died by his own hands, spoke with him between 2000 hours and 2030 hours. He denied every fundamental doctrine of the Bible. He hinted at communion, but since he denied the Lord Jesus as his Savior, I could not commune him. He had, he, had he been sincere in his quest, he would not have gone the way he did. And, of course, he's speaking to the fact that uh, shortly after he met with, uh, with Gehring, Gehring took his own life by cyanide capsule. Okay, next slide. There's a little zoomed-in version of the... There you go. Um, another important uh, use for these chaplain files is that there's a, another series that goes along with them, and it's index cards for burial services. And if you if you know the individual who's who was buried, who who died during the war, we can actually look them up in this index series. And from there, if they have a card, it will list the chaplain who held the services and the day or the, the month and year that the services were provided from there we can go on to the to the monthly files and we can go to the next slide I think it'll zoom in yeah you can see there that that Francis N Cunningham was has had services provided here and Sometimes it just gives the name of the individual and their rank and service number. Other times there's a little more information. Like in this case, it gives his unit, the place of burial, and next of kin. And that is all that I have. I am going to pass it on to Daria. Hi, I'm Daria Lubinsky, and uh, I'm going to talk today about burial case files and deceased veterans claim files. Uh, first slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, the burial case files, which are in uh, OPA, the National Archive Identifier, is 595318. Uh, they're officially called Correspondence, Reports, Telegrams, Applications, and Other Papers Relating to the Burials of Service Personnel. And they're also called cemeterial files or 293 files. Next slide, please. Okay, they were created by the Quartermaster General's Office between 1915 and 1935 uh, to record information relating to service members' burials in national cemeteries overseas. Uh, primarily, we have uh, World War I uh, burial case files, uh, and they are arranged alphabetically by last name. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, some of the things they may contain. Uh, one of the things they almost always have is information on reburial. Uh, often if someone was killed overseas, they would be buried three times. They would have been buried right in a hasty grave right after uh, a battle. They would be buried maybe in a American, small American cemetery and then later on in a national cemetery. So they would have reburial information. This here is the report of disinterment and reburial for a cook named Ferdinand Hess, who was uh, killed from, it says he would died from wounds received in action on August 27, 1918. And he was first buried at a church cemetery, and then he was moved to an American cemetery, and then he was buried in the Wazan National Cemetery. And that didn't happen until September 1922, so his body traveled a little bit. And um, sometimes there's very graphic information on these files. This, um, sometimes body parts would have been shot off or somebody was killed by shelling and there would be parts of their body missing. And the, burial, uh, the bodies were not embalmed the first time they were buried, so sometimes they could lose some bones. And this notice, uh, this one mentions that he is missing the right and left tibia and fibula. Next slide, please. Another document you'll often find is the circumstances of death document. And this is for Private Salvatore Biscamo from New York City. And he died right outside of Poperinch, Belgium. And he was killed by a shell. 
uh, and they're usually like a sworn statement from someone who saw the person get killed. So they're, they're very interesting if you're trying to figure out how someone died. Next slide, please. Uh, these are grave markers uh, or identification discs, and they often were attached to like a wooden cross at the first uh, uh, burial site so that it, you could help identify the body. This one belonged to Harry Miller. He was a sergeant with the 96th Company of the 6th Marines who was killed in the Battle of Blockmont Ridge in October 1918. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, they often have correspondence. Uh, sometimes there'll be congressional correspondence if there's an issue that the um, survivors are having trying to get uh, someone's body returned to the United States, or uh, in one case there was an a incident where the body was the wrong one. They opened up the, somebody opened up the coffin and discovered it wasn't their, their relative. Um, this one is from a funeral director named W. R. Millward, and he was from Lexington, Kentucky, and he wrote a letter to the quartermaster general's office, and he wanted to be endorsed as being recommended as the leading funeral director in Lexington, Kentucky. And the item that's circled on the left is a notation in somebody's handwriting that says impossible. Uh, uh, there will also be correspondence um, from the military to members of the family trying to determine who is the proper person who, to determine the dispositions of remains. Sometimes there were arguments about where the body should be. Should it be kept overseas or do they want it back in the United States? And those are interesting for genealogists because they often you had to list all the next of kin in their relationship. Next slide, please. Uh, other interesting items we found, um, there have been requests for photos of the grave and the Red Cross would comply and send a photo. Uh, there would be applications for headstones, uh, for military cemetery headstones. Uh, this one is a receipt for flowers from a florist in France, uh, and Sergeant George Call family uh, asked that there be flowers placed on his grave, and this shows that they complied. Uh, next slide. Uh, burial case files also contain information on the Gold Star Mothers. Uh, the Gold Star Mothers uh, program was a U.S. government-sponsored visits to grave sites in Belgium, France, and England by mothers and widows. Uh, or sometimes sisters, if mothers couldn't go when they didn't have a widow, um, of deceased World War I servicemen from 1930 to 1933. Uh, they were all expense-paid trips. More than 17,000 women were eligible for this, and Ancestry.com has an index to all the eligible women, but it doesn't indicate too much information other than that they were eligible. Um, more than 6,600 attended uh, th these visits. and. Um, they were segregated trips. African American women were taken on separate trips, and they had separate accommodations, a separate ship, uh, passenger sh uh, ship, and then separate um, train travel also. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is Ferdinand Hess, who was the cook I mentioned earlier. This is his mother, Mary. She was one of the Gold Star Mothers. She left home at, on May 12, 1930. She was 59 years old. and. Um, these are the things that you can find in these files of when there is a Gold Star Mother. They always had to have a headshot for their passport. You see a lot of refusals due to poor health, um, and they would often get asked again if they wanted to come if they denied, they turned it down the first year. Um, and there's, so there's correspondence in there. They're very interesting. Uh, next slide, please. And this shows her itinerary, uh, one of the pages of her itinerary, and it mentions that on May 26th, Mrs. Margaret Forsyth, who was chosen as the honor pilgrim for the group, placed a wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier, and then afterwards they all went to tea. And then on the right uh, is a telegram that Mary had was sent that said her husband was ill and she should hurry home. This was by the, she was back in the United States at this time, and they were saying get on the soonest train. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the deceased veterans' claim files, uh, also known as the Compensation files, the VA claim files, and the XC files. And they're from Record Group 15, the Department of Veterans Affairs Records. Uh, these are not yet in online public access catalog. We just finished getting our last shipment of them at the beginning of this month. Next slide. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about the history of these records. You might be familiar with pension files. Uh, they started doing that in, during the Revolutionary War. Um, and in 1917, they added the War Risk Insurance Bill. And basically what, what 
what happened as, as, as veterans aged, um, new legislation would be passed and they would extend benefits and change benefits for different veterans. Um, in 1921, the Veterans Bureau was con created and that consolidated the Bureau of War Risk Insurance, the Public Health Service, and the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation. So that they were basically saying we're going to combine all these different kind of benefits into one, one clearinghouse kind of agency. Um, our cases were opened between 1917 and 1945, uh, and I'll get into a little more about that in a, in a bit. Um, but if you look at this microfilm index card for Private Michael Fitzpatrick, he was in service between, uh, from 1917 to 1920, and the letters uh, correspond to the files all, for all the different kinds of benefits he had. So he had a life insurance, he had adjusted compensation, which was a bonus pay. If you heard of, ever heard about the bonus riots, that's what they were talking about. Uh, war risk insurance, rehabilitation money, and uh, then he also had a World War I certificate. And that notice that there's no, nothing next to the letter I, that means he did not have any permanent disability coverage. Um, these uh, records that we have, next slide please, are um, 1952 to 1955. There are two different transfers. The, what happens is the Veterans Administration, when the cases are closed, the records get filed away and then eventually they transfer them to a NARA Federal Record Center. In that case, they still belong to the VA. They're retired records, but they're not part of the National Archives. The records that we have that are VA claim files are from 1952 and 1955 transfers. So those records are open to the public and they no longer belong to the Veterans Administration. They belong to the National Archives. Uh, the 1955, as I said, are, uh, 1952 are primarily World War I, but the 1955 accession also has uh, includes inside the claim file Civil War pension files, files from Indian War, Spanish-American War, Philippine insurrection, China relief expedition, and uh, veterans who served between wars, regular army, they weren't actually in the war. And this is where it gets kind of tricky because uh, Archives 1 in Washington has Civil War pension files, but we also have some Civil War pension files because if someone was still living, or the widow was still living, in the 1920s, the Veterans Administration, Veterans Bureau would give the case a new number, and it would be a C for living or XC deceased. And they would stick that pension file in with all these other records. So it, they would have a new number, which would be their claim file number. And the, in these cases had to be closed. No one could be receiving benefits for the veteran the veteran would have to be dead, beneficiaries would have to be dead uh, before the record could be closed. So if someone died in 1960, we're not gonna have their record. If someone's widow died in 1960, we're not gonna have their record. Everybody had to be deceased. In our case, it's about 1945 is when we see the latest um, uh, dates of death. And the other ones are still, they still belong to the Department of Veterans Affairs. So, and sometimes the veteran, the VA could, decide a record was closed and then there was another request for it and they could take the record out of that transfer and it could be put in a new transfer. So in that case, we still wouldn't have this record. So uh, the VA records are all over the country uh, based on where the regional office was. Next slide, please. Okay, and indicating that records are not, many records are not closed. As of May 2014, there was uh, one Civil War child left, and that's her, Irene Triplett. She was born in 1930, and her father was a Civil War veteran who was 83 years old. She's still alive. Her case is still open. There are 16 children and spouses from the Spanish-American War, and there were 4,038 surviving children and spouses from World War I. These are all open cases. They're not open to the public. They still belong to the VA, and people are still receiving benefits. And uh, we have a very small percentage of records between that range of XC2 and XC3990713. We only have about 10% of those records. So even if you have a claim file and it's a number in that range, we might not have it. There's a good chance we won't have it since we only have about 300,000 to 275,000 to 300,000 records. Um, next slide, please. Okay, what things you can find in the records? Uh, if it, we have the veteran, we have the full name of the individual, birth date, parents, names of parents, names of family members, 
dates of enlistment, periods of service, unit they were in, their residence at the time they enlisted, their death date if they were killed. If they survived, we, would have, we might have a copy of their discharge papers. Next slide, please. And if, also if they survived, medical records, and these can contain many, many medical records because they had to submit these claims every time they wanted to be, receive benef benefits. Uh, changes of address, wills, death certificates, and funeral receipts. This is from Captain Watson Reynolds. He died of blood poisoning during, um, during World War II, but he was stationed in Ohio. And uh, the funeral director also sold refrigerators. Next slide, please. And you can also find things from family members, including correspondence, marriage certificates, birth certificates, affidavits, which are really interesting because they, they verify the person says who they say they are. They verify people's marriage, that, who their children are. There's always inf you know, very inf interesting information about uh, the families. And people would send in elaborate certificates, and they would ask for them returned. They'd also send in photos, and they would never get them back, which is why we have them. Next slide. And uh, other interesting items, uh, I I'm just always think that these are better than a soap opera because there are some really interesting cases. We'll find paternity issues and bigamy and people who had common law wives and people who had girlfriends that the family didn't like and you'll see people fighting over money constantly. And we've even had like assault cases, all, all kinds of interesting things. Um, this, we have um, a widow's pension on the right, and that is from a Civil War pension file. The woman uh, died in 1940, the widow. Her name was Adele Eugene, and her husband was with the 73rd U.S. Colored Troops. And because she was in New Orleans, um, she was a French Creole, and a lot of the documents are in French with translations, which is, which is neat. And um, this document, she had a list of the age, or the birth date, and the names of all her children. And then, um, we also would have insurance applications, which include things like uh, the names of dependents, including step-parents, brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters, sometimes nieces and nephews, and uh, foreign documents. Uh, sometimes um, there would be dozens, you know, we've, we've seen dozens of languages. Um, there were 20% of the World War I, um, American World War I soldiers were actually immigrants, were foreign-born. And so there'll be a lot of times their beneficiaries were back home, and so they would have to get in touch with those people to, to determine who would get the money. And so there'll be foreign documents, and often they were translated, and sometimes there were documents from the consul, consulates uh, affirming these people are who they say they are. And so they'll have things like foreign addresses, really very, very interesting. Uh, and also photos. Um, this is um, the sister of a veteran named John Canulis, who was from Lithuania, and his, the documents in there are, are Lithuanian, and um, they sent this picture in because the mother wanted to know if the daughter could receive benefits because she was born with three fingers on each hand, and so she sent this picture in to show that what she was talking about, and they told her, no, sisters are not considered beneficiaries of deceased veterans. Next slide, please. If you want to locate these records, um, for a burial case file, we need the full name, date of birth and or death, and service number. For the VA claim files, full name, claim file number, uh, place of residence or enlistment can help, date of birth and or death. Uh, during World War I, not all service members had service numbers. They weren't issued until 1918. So if you have one, it's good, but if you don't, that's not that crucial. Um, and it's also important, if a person doesn't have a middle name, you know, say that there's no middle name because you'll have a lot of people named John Thompson and if you know it's John, no middle initial Thompson, it's going to be a lot easier to, for us to find it. Uh, next slide, please. And um, this is kind of uh, useful. If you are looking for a claim file for someone who served before World War I, there's a database on ancestry called the Civil War Pension Index. And even though it's called that, it's not just Civil War. It goes up to 1934. So we've been able to find things like Spanish-American War veterans in this database, as well as pension. And you'll see they'll have an XC number on it, and that'll indicate they had a claim. Um, this is uh, Tony Janicki's um, uh, index card form from the Ancestry.com database. And he's, his other name was Tony Janeski. 
he fought with, in the war with Spain, and um, he had an alias. And so if you know somebody has an alias, that can also be very useful. And also, we've, we've, if somebody had different spellings of their names, it's also useful if you can uh, give us that, too. Sometimes we found one record where the person had nine different spellings of their name inside the record. Uh, and that's all I have to sort of talk about. We're happy to take your questions. This is our email, our address, um, National Archives at St. Louis, box 38757, uh, zip code 63138, or our email address, stl.archives.nara.gov. Okay. Hello. We have several a long list of questions that have come in from your online audience. I'll start with a few of the questions that relate to your portion of the presentation, Daria. Okay. The first one is how far back do these burial files go? Um, they're, they're from World War I. So um, occasionally we have seen um, other documents from Civil War relating to, that are just headstone applications. That's all, that's all they are. And most of those um, are interfiled just by the name of the person, but but they are they are World War One, so they they were started in 1915. So if we're not sure if the Civil War veterans' descendants were all deceased before 1955, where and how do we request that information of the Civil War vet and the VA? Okay, if you look at the pension file index on Ancestry, and uh, see, you can look on that card. It was the, one of the last things I just showed. Uh, it should have an XC number if they have a claim file. Um, some veterans do not have pension files. We just, I just had to do a search today and the veteran was not approved for a, vet, for a pension. Uh, so if you have that number and it's in our range between 2 and 3990713, we might have that record, but we can't guarantee we have that record, but it's a start. And uh, you can request send the request in to us and we'll look it up first. And if we don't have it, we'll tell you how to get in touch with the VA FOIA office. Your next question. I have a great aunt who was enlisted in the Women's Air Force Corps in 1951 and in October 1951 was stationed at Camp Lee, Virginia. How do I go about getting her military records? Yeah, you, you probably just want to fill out a standard form 180 or go on to um, NARA's website and get to NPRC for the um, online uh, request form and that that request would actually go to the National Personnel Records Center where they would would handle that case. Would the record show a marriage if it happened while they were in the service in World War II? Uh, oftentimes. Um, if you're talking about it in an OMPF, I mean, it's a possibility, but you need to remember that there was the fire in 1973, so a lot of Army records in particular were lost and, and Air, Corps, uh, Air Force records. So it's a possibility. The next question, where would I find records for someone who served in the reserves? Uh, we, we have reserve records here in St. Louis as well. Again, that would be a, a standard Form 180 request or an online request going to the National Personnel Records Center. Where do you find the alien registration forms? Um, for those, again, this is, those would be kept here at our location. Uh, to request those, you would fill out the form that I included in the presentation um, and I would search for those after I find um, the registration and classification. Um, so yeah, fill out the form that I included, and if that person, remember, they have to have been a non-citizen resident, an alien, to fill out this additional form. And then, depending on what state they resided in, there's the possibility that we have it. Um, again, this is based state to state, so with each request, it's just a unique search, and I will search that and see what we do have. What is the policy on privacy for living individuals? Um, 
Well, if it's an open record, it's open to the public. There are certain things that do get redacted, you know, if it's sensitive information or social security numbers. But the, you know, the series that we talked about today are completely open. Um, of course, most of these individuals are not alive. If you're talking about the OMPF, that's the 62-year rule where 62 years after the person is separated from military service, that record becomes open to the public. And that's where some of the redaction comes in. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, but the, even if the person is alive, um, the record is still open to the public. Anyone can request it. The next question. I thought most of the World War II info was lost in a fire. Can you clarify, please? Yes, there, there was a large portion of the OMPF, which is the official military personnel files, those were affected by the fire. Um, what the the records that we're talking about here today were not in this in St. Louis at the time of the fire. They were not affected. Uh, Teresa Fitzgerald will talk a little bit more about that in her presentation in a couple hours. Um, Navy and Marine Corps records were not affected by the fire. Only Army and parts of the Air Force records, and they were all again official military personnel files. They weren't other other record series. And we do have other auxiliary files, uh, auxiliary series that Teresa will talk about later on today that we can use to, um, as, as sort of a surrogate for the information that was lost. Would a soldier get a new service number when they re-enlisted or would it stay the same? No, the service number stayed the same. Unless they became an officer. Sure. And sometimes they they'd get a new number. Are, are any of the classification records available online for World War II cards? The classification records are not online. Um, those you would have to request and we would send uh, the requester a copy of that. If I visit NARA in person, can I find this record myself and copy myself without paying fees? Um, you can't search for the record yourself. You can fill out a request form in our research room and someone from our staff will search for the file. It will be delivered to you to look at in the research room and you can make your own copies for a small copy fee, per page fee. You can also bring in a scanner and scan your record. Where could I find records for someone who served in the Merchant Marines during World War I? Also Coast Guard. Coast Guard records we have in St. Louis. Merchant Marine records, we're still sort of in negotiations trying to get those records from the National Maritime Center. Um, they're currently spread throughout the National Archives Record Centers, uh, various locations, but they're still in the NMC's custody. So we do have some records here in St. Louis, and we have records of deceased seamen uh, from, from the World War II era. Um, but for generally for, for the, the a, a merchant mariner, you should probably contact the National Maritime Center in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and stay tuned. They will be coming to St. Louis sometime soon. If someone is doing on-site research, can they bring their own scanner? Yes. And digital camera. And cameras. digital camera. And then they have a follow-up. They said that they have a little wand scanner. And no. I'm thinking that I, I work in the research rooms here downtown, and if, if it's touching the records, then it's right. probably going to be banned, correct? correct? Correct. Okay. Next question. How can I find my grandmother's service records? All I have been able to find is her U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs BIRLS death file. Mm -hmm. Uh. We, it would, that's a request you could make here. Um, you would just need her name and if you have her birth date, information about her, do you know where, where she served or what branch of service she was in, that would be helpful. Are there any Army service records still available for World War II? I find nothing on my father or his two brothers who served overseas. Again, Teresa Fitzgerald's gonna talk about that in the session in two hours. Um, ways you can search for a veteran if the record was destroyed in the fire. But yes, there were records recovered. Um, 
Yeah, very few records were recovered in whole. Uh, there's bits and pieces, there's documents. Um, they might be singed, they might be completely burned. We do have a preservation staff that can, that can work with those records to get them stabilized to a point where they can be viewed or copied. Uh, and then also we have the auxiliary files um, for pay records and awards cards and that sort of thing that can make up that service. So it's always worth uh, putting in a request and saying that you know that you want any documents available. Thank you, Daria, David, and Stephen. If the speakers did not get to your question, please send an email to inquire at nara.gov. We will now have a short intermission.